You are listening to programming from the East-West Center in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Satu LeMay. I'm the Vice President of the East-West Center and delighted to have you today for our Indo-Pacific Security and Foreign Policy Seminar that focuses on Japan as a global military power, new capabilities, alliance integration, bilateralism plus. And we're delighted to have today with us two uh, eminent experts on Japan, including its defense, security, and foreign policies. The author of the book that we're focusing on today that has just come out this year from Cambridge University Press is by uh, Dr. Christopher Hughes at the University of Warwick. You will have his biographical information, but suffice it to say, he's professor of Japanese studies and international politics, and also serving as the pro vice chancellor and vice president of education at that esteemed university. So uh, delighted to have Christopher back uh, on an East West Center program and congratulations on your book. Chris, we're really uh, looking forward to hearing uh, more about your findings and your conclusions. We also have as a discussant today, uh, Dr. Ellis Krauss, who's Professor Emeritus, School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California at San Diego. Many of you who are on this program today will be well aware of uh, Dr. Krauss's significant contributions to the study of Japan, Japanese politics, and his Brookings book, uh, which deals with uh, a comparative view of um, both Japan and Germany and their alliance commitments with the US as they shape their foreign and security policies. So thank you both for joining. I know it's a little earlier there in California, Dr. Krauss, and a little later in the evening there in Warwick, Chris. So thank you both. Um, I can't think of a better timing for this program. As uh, many of you will know, uh, there was a state funeral for Japan's former assassinated Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe. Um, Vice President uh, Kamala Harris of the United States obviously met with Prime Minister Kishida uh, yesterday or today, and and so that there's a lot of focus on Japan, um, you know, immediately in the context of our uh, high politics and 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 bilateral relations in the context of the funeral and and these meetings. Uh, but there are also very important upcoming events uh, that Chris and I were discussing. At the end of the year, Japan will issue its new national, revised national security strategy, its new NDPG or national defense policy guidelines, as well as midterm defense plans, which uh, might more look like a defense strategy. In any case, the timing is perfect. Japan is still a critical global player and a major American ally. And we thank you, Chris, uh, for your book and your comments today, and then followed by uh, Dr. Krauss. So welcome. Welcome to all of our viewers and participants on this virtual program today. And Dr. Hughes, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Statu. Thanks, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so I, th I think we have uh, um, relatively constrained time today. So I'll try and be fairly quick. Uh, I have a presentation. I'll run through it. Um, I won't go into detail in, in, in everything in the in the book, um, but I'll try and give you a flavour of the of the key arguments. Um, I hope you can uh, I hope you can see my my, my slides okay. Um, so um, just a little bit about the context and the, really what I was trying to do in the book. Um, as Satu as Satu mentioned, um, one of my one of my day jobs is vice president for education at, at my university. So um, over the last two years, there's been this thing called COVID. <laughs> which has kept uh, people who work in education uh, rather busy. Uh, so I have responsibility for about 30,000 students and I had to, to design all the flip online for all the teaching and learning. So that, that took a lot of time, but um, this is in a sense, this is my lockdown project. Um, so the UK, as you may be aware, had um, two, two national lockdowns and I started this book in the second national lockdown. It was a very nice distraction from some of the things I had to do related to COVID. And, and it was kind of a nice chance actually to, take stock on some of the work uh, that I've done before, but also to try and take on board some of the recent work on, on Japan that I hadn't had much chance to engage in for a couple of years. So it was a really nice project to sort of draw together a lot of my past thinking, but also to try and engage in some of the current current debates. Um, and a lot of those debates and that work is terrific. Um, but really what I was trying to do in this book was to maybe challenge some of the existing analysis somewhat 
and to produce a, a, a new synthesis. Um, and the task I was given by Cambridge University Press and the series editors was to do all this in quite a short and accessible format. So the book uh, is quite short, it's only about 100 pages long, and I had to pack quite a lot in. And I was told to sort of cover um, all the developments in Japanese security policy, but also to try and make a, a distinctive argument. So uh, it was quite a challenge, but very interesting exercise. Um, so the book is out. Uh, it came out in August. Uh, it's now available in, in, in hard copy. Uh, and uh, it's also available um, gold open access. I managed to secure that. So anybody who wants to can download it for free permanently. Um, and uh, there's a link at the end of the uh, 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 slides if anybody would like to, to do that. Um, and again, I just want to thank the editors of the series, um, particularly Mary Alice Haddad, who encouraged me to, to write it, uh, um, Ellis for, for um, uh, being a discussant today. It's fantastic to see Ellis. Uh, and again, the East West Centre and Satu for, for agreeing to, to sponsor this talk. Um, so, um, really, the starting point of the book uh, is. Um, uh, that over the last three decades, I mean, when you look back, um, again, everything sometimes seems to move slowly in Japan, but when you look back over the broad sweep uh, and you do what Dick Samuels used to talk about, when you sort of connect the dots, you can see that actually there's been a tremendous change in Japan over the last three decades since Japan first ventured to send JSDF overseas uh, in the wake of the, uh, the, the first Gulf War. Uh, so um, Japan is, I would argue, emerging as pretty significant regional and now actually global military power across a range of areas, and hence the title why I decided to call it Japan as a, as a global military power. Um, so geographically, the extent of what Japan does in, in security is, has really stretched from, of course, its own homeland through to Northeast Asia, through to the Asia Pacific, now that's been redefined, through to the Indo-Pacific. Um, in terms of uh, functional domains um, and missions, so of course Japan is not just active in sea, uh, land and air, but also now in cyber and in, in outer space, uh, and a range of missions, not just UNPKO, logistical supports, uh, anti counter piracy, but also now talking about actual combat missions, uh, if necessary, through collective self defense. And then the range of frameworks that Japan has engaged in has also expanded greatly over the last three decades. So, of course, the US Japan Alliance is, is really cr crucial and pivotal, as I as argue in the book, but also we can see lots of activity in terms of new bilateral relationships, quasi-alliances, multilateral frameworks, mini-lateral frameworks, and so on. So there's a lot of activity uh, and diversity in what Japan is doing. And Japan's own military capabilities are, are, are growing. Uh, for its own homeland defense, um, you could argue for power projection potentially. And of course, there's a very vigorous uh, debate in Japan right now about counter-strike uh, and what Japan will do in this area. So lots of change. And then of course, also the, the discourse in Japan, the discussion in Japan, I think has started to change quite significantly over the last few years. It's been building for a while, but I think over the last few years, um, there's been a real uh, change. I think a sea change uh, in terms of Japan's strategic intent and the political and constitutional constraints on what Japan can do uh, in uh, its uh, military policy. So we have the thing which I've written about before, Called the Abe Doctrine. I'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a moment. Um, the the whole discussion, the whole discourse around the proactive contribution to peace, which I think has raised expectations globally that Japan may do more, uh, uh, not only for its own security but perhaps with others. Uh, and a lot of this trajectory, again, we can talk about this, but I think basically a lot of Abe's trajectory, all the things that were building, and then Abe, uh, in a sense, realised uh, and and implemented are continuing under Asuga uh, and Kishida as his successors. So a tremendous amount of activity uh, in Japanese security policy. So then really uh, what I wanted to do in this in this short book was to try and make some sense of these trends. You know, how, how do we explain this? Um, where is Japan going? What's its trajectory? Uh, and can we rely on the existing forms of uh, main forms of analysis that we've uh, have tended to frame this debate uh, to date? So uh, this table is an, uh, an effort to sort of try and frame some of the, if you like, sort of four principal, uh, again, it's rather idealized, but sort of four principal, I think, exp um, um, sort of um, debates uh, around where Japan is going in its security policy. So the first one I call is, is the Yoshida Doctrine. The Yoshida Doctrine rules okay. So in a sense, not that much has changed. Um, Japan is still clinging to the, to the Yoshida Doctrine, uh, minimalist defense capabilities, minimalist contribution to the alliance, hedging in terms of its, in terms of its um, commitments. 
but that doesn't seem to really stack up, I think, against some of the limitations, and particularly just empirical observation, when we see the continuous build-up of Japanese defence capabilities and the strengthening of the US-Japan alliance commitments. Uh, second uh, type of explanations around what you might call residual pacifism or anti-militarism. Uh, again, of course, very powerful constraints in the past, but again, it doesn't seem to stack up anymore, really, when you see that Japanese policymakers have rather systematically um, um, dismantled most of the post-war constitutional and anti-militaristic constraints on Japanese military power. So that seems less convincing. Um, then there's a, 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 a sort of thrust of the debate around maybe Japan is um, uh, becoming more internationalist or more multilateralist in terms of how it wants to use uh, its, its military power, or even perhaps it's decentering from the United States, uh, becoming less dependent on the United States or looking for more options. Um, but again, I asked the question, uh, Japan, does that really stack up, given that this has always been rather limited in the grand scheme of things or Jap Japanese grand strategy? Uh, and actually, in some areas, whilst Japan is devoting more resources, in other, it's actually declining in terms of its devotion of policy resources and, and material resources to this more internationalist, multilateralist approach. And then finally, there's always this, this view that perhaps Japan is just biding its time. And in fact, what it's doing is, 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 is looking to eventually gain more autonomy or some sort of strategic breakout from dependency on the United States. But again, I feel this is rather doubtful given just how deep US-Japan military ties have become. And I would argue actually inextricably uh, in, it become in terms of Japan's limited ability to really break away from, from that relationship. So none of the existing arguments really seem to hold or, or, or convincing enough anymore. So what I do in the book is actually, um, as I was saying to Sato earlier on, I think um, um, really what I want to do is go beyond this existing analysis. And I pro propose what I think is rather straightforward um, um, analysis or, or conclusion. Perhaps it's blindingly obvious, um, but actually in some ways it seems quite radical, given that many past analyses are sort of still holding on to, uh, I think rather, well, kind of um, outdated views of, of um, uh, Japan's military policy. Uh, and so I come up with this, uh, I've tried to come up with a new categorization of Japan's military trajectory. Uh, and quite simply, what I argue is Japan is, is seeking to respond to what is a very, you know, very challenging external security environment by becoming an increasingly capable, reliable, and this is a crucial word, integrated US ally. Uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's obvious, but actually I think we need to say it. Uh, and I think it is somewhat different from some of the discourses that we've seen that have tended to dominate in terms of and how we've interpreted Japan. I think this also means that Japan's expanded regional and global military cooperation uh, and the work that it does with other partners, yes, that's there's a lot of that, there's an increasing quantity, but essentially it's, it's designed to conform with and to reinforce the US-Japan alliance and the US-centered regional architecture for Japan's homeland defense. Again, maybe that seems blindingly obvious, but I think this is essentially what Japan is doing. Uh, and then consequently, some of the more, I think some of the more um, elevated talk um, or over optimistic talk about Japan, uh, perhaps trying to seek alternatives, uh, Japan trying to seek more autonomy or trying to seek international security cooperation outside these parameters uh, is um, inaccurate and probably partners who hope for more cooperation outside these parameters are going to be disappointed. So that's the essential argument. Um, and the way that I lay it out, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just try and give you a quick brief tour of the sections of the book uh, and what the essential arguments are. And then maybe we can pick up more in the, in the discussion from Ellis and uh, from Crash Q&A and so on. Um, but essentially, the first, the first section of the book really looks at this at Japan's shifting strategic and military outlook. Uh, and what I argue is that Japanese policymakers now perceive that the Yoshida Doctrine, which has dominated Japanese strategic pathway, grand strategy in the post-war period, they see it as really essentially no longer adaptable, can no longer flex, and it's really no longer tenable as a grand strategy to respond to the challenges that Japan has uh, in its, in its defence and, and security policy. So there is, a, I think, again, a kind of fundamental shift and acceptance now that Japan does have to take on greater defensive responsibilities for its own homeland defence and to some extent regional defense. But again, this is going to be done mainly through the mechanism of the US-Japan Alliance and US security system. Uh, and another important shift is that if necessary, uh, Japan may in, in, in undertake some global responsibilities. Again, hence the name of the, 
of the book, uh, it may have to undertake collective self-defense responsibilities. Again, that's another major change since 2015. I think there's been a real mind shift in mindset for Japanese policymakers or, or elites at least. Um, and this again, this is necessary in order to, sh to shore up and support and reinvest in the US regional and global security system. So we have seen a shift, I think, from the old Yoshida doctrine to this new Abe doctrine and this talk about a proactive contribution to peace. Um, and uh, in turn, there are, if, I think there are sort of, it's been building for a long time. It came before, before Abe, but again, I think Abe, in a sense, you know, crossed the Rubicon here. Uh, and there are three principal aspects to Japanese security policy, which are then, and military policy, which I then explore for the book. So I look at territorial defense, Japan's own capabilities, uh, US-Japan cooperation and cooperation with the international community. So the next section of the book looks at Japan's transforming defense doctrine and capabilities. Uh, again, I don't have time to go into everything in detail, but I argue that the JSDF has now moved from the old basic defense force to uh, uh, a multi-dimensional defense force, characterized by a real um, uh, striving for more mobility, uh, but also jointness, I think. And so Japan is trying to undertake, undertake a sort of defense transformation effort, which we hadn't seen before in, 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 in the SDF. So greater working of the three services together and across into, into different domains. Um, we're seeing uh, some pretty significant procurement of advanced capabilities by the three services, which could offer the potential for global deployments, but actually increasingly what Japan is devoting those capabilities to uh, is for its own homeland defense. And particularly, of course, defense of its Southwestern islands from potential Chinese uh, incursions. Uh, there's a section of the book that looks at defense expenditure and the trends uh, for what the LDP called the radical strengthening or drastic strengthening or reinforcement of Japanese defense capabilities. And then there's a section which explores counter-strike, which again, I think is a really significant uh, evolution uh, in Japanese defense policy. And again, there'll be some very interesting things as Sato talked about at the end of this year, uh, where Japan, I think, will try to, the LDP will try and the government will try to get to a conclusion about, uh, you know, can Japan, or not can Japan, but how may Japan build counter-strike into its defense doctrine? Uh, the third main section of the book is about the US-Japan alliance, and again, what I call US-Japan alliance integration. I think this is really key, and this, is, this marks off what Japan was doing for most of the post-war and what's happened since, um, since Abe, really. So um, what we're seeing is, um, you know, whenever Japan has doubts about US commitment to, to the region or to Japan's defence, what it does is double down. Uh, and this is a, a phrase, I think, used by, by Adam Liff, and I, I share that, that, that view that Japan is not really hedging against dependence on, on the US, US anymore. Actually, what it's doing is reinvesting and deepening and solidifying those alliance links uh, with the United States in the face of challenges. Uh, and the Abe Doctrine really deepens that cooperation and, and less and less hedging, almost to the point of actually Japan is probably, probably giving up on many of its past hedging gains inside and outside the alliance. And you can see this through the revised US-Japan defense guidelines. And of course, crucially, Japan taking the decision to be able to um, exercise collective self-defense in certain scenarios in support of the United States. We can also see this operationally in terms of the US-Japan and how they're integrating their capabilities and their doctrine for the first time. So it started with missile defense, but it's now moving into space, cyber, host nation support. Uh, and crucially, I think we're on the ground, what we're seeing is we're seeing the United St uh, Japan uh, and the JSDF and US forces beginning to mirror and to really match what they do in terms of island chain defense uh, and potentially Taiwan defense. So Japan has become integrated into that overall US strategy. Uh, and then of course, the other interesting thing again is if Japan does acquire its own uh, spear now uh, in terms of counter-strike, again, I think that will be, that will be integrated into uh, the, um, uh, the whole US deterrence system and that, and that ladder of escalation uh, around deterrence. And then finally, the last section uh, is what I call still bilateralism plus. Uh, and uh, again, Ellis will know all about this, but um, this is uh, really this deals with these, this kind of this, this a mass of new bilateral, multilateral, minilateral um, security defense relationships that Japan has built up over the last couple of decades or so, uh, and what this means. Um, and what I argue is it just doesn't mean, as I, as I referred before, that Japan is somehow seeking multilateral alternatives or trying to decenter from the United States. But actually what it's practicing 
uh, is something which I wrote about 20 years ago uh, in a book edited by, by Ellis and TJ Pempel. Uh, it's the same pattern, which I call bilateralism plus. So in other words, all of this, this networking and building up these new relationships essentially serves to reinforce uh, the US-Japan relationship at the, at the core of Japanese security. So everything is plus. So bilateralism, it's that US-Japan relationship, but everything just simply adds to that um, rather than tries to distract or detract uh, from that relationship. Again, I don't have much time, but you know, briefly I go through some of the kind of international cooperation that Japan is engaged in. UNPKO, that could have been an alternative perhaps, that's often talked about as some uh, as an, an additional, perhaps a, an alternative to reliance on the United States. But again, Japan is doing very, very little uh, in that area. And in fact, many ways it uses uh, the, the, the legitimacy of the UN in order to actually um, uh, really carry on with many of its traditional um, defense cooperation with the United States. International cooperation, you know, Japan has embarked on certain kinds of extra regional uh, cooperation. Um, but again, often uh, it uses the language of international contribution, but essentially what it's doing is really trying to strengthen the relationship with the United States. And then there's a whole range of, 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 of these kind of new bilateral, multilateral, minilateral relationships that Japan has built up. But again, they're, essentially they're just an extension of the US-Japan alliance system. Uh, in many cases, they're focused on US allies and partners. They include the United States. They use the US-Japan alliance as, as essentially a template. Uh, and it's all about integrated deterrence. So it's, a bit, it's sort of plug and play, being able to integrate other allies into uh, the US-centered, uh, the US-Japan-centered um, um, uh, alliance system. So uh, in a sense, it's still bilateralism plus. Um, Japan is not looking for alternatives. What it's doing is, is, is looking for other ways to shore up that uh, US-Japan uh, alliance relationship. So that really, that's a quick, that's just a very quick tour of the, of, of the book. Um, and I suppose by conclusion, I say, you know, Japan is becoming a, a global military power, but uh, it's very selective and it's within these parameters. So Japan will venture out globally, it will do more uh, with other partners. But again, it will only do that in order to service the needs of the US-Japan alliance and to service its own homeland security. So those allies who are hoping for Japan to be more forthcoming or that active um, are probably going to be disappointed so but nevertheless there's still much to play for and I think um, European partners Asian partners uh, they may be able to coax Japan to do more uh, uh, with them but at the moment I think Japan is fun fundamentally really interested in its own its own defense in the US Japan alliance so that's a, this is a quick tour I hope that's uh, hope, hope that's a useful introduction that's wonderful, Chris. Uh, very uh, enlightening. I mean, I would encourage everyone to either download or get the book so you have a copy. But uh, I know uh, we're a little short on time today, but I really appreciate you getting through that. That was terrific. And now we're delighted to have uh, Dr. Krauss with us um, and uh, offer some comments on the book and raise some questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Krauss. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. My old friend, Chris Hughes. Uh, Chris may not remember, but I flew to be at the University of Warwick on September 11th, 2001, which was a very interesting day to be in the air. Uh, but our friendship goes back and our collegiality goes back even before that. So it's a pleasure for me to be here and to discuss Chris's book. I've read the whole thing, part of it digitally, part of it in the hard copy, which just arrived about 10 days ago. Um, so let, without further ado, let me switch to my screen here. And uh, I hope you can see that. Can you see it? Not yet, Dr. Krauss. Let me... Uh... If okay. you can't get it up there now, then maybe uh, our Miss Lynch, our um, uh, event. I have it on my screen. How do I switch it over to yours? Or how do you switch it over? Let me see if I can get it on my screen. Okay. Do you see it, Chris? I do not see the PowerPoint. I, I can't see it yet. Yeah, not yet. Hmm. That's bizarre. Okay. Um, well, let me get out of it for the moment and uh, go back here to Zoom. And uh, what do I have to press to get it on there? <laughs> I'm um, sharing the screen. Do you want me to? I, I, is uh, it? It's on PowerPoint. There it is. Okay, share. Yes, I wanted to share my screen. Okay, I don't know why that came up, but something else came up there. 
Can you see it now? Not quite yet. Chris, do you have this? Do you have uh, I, Dr. Cross's? Uh, I slide? do. I, I was going to suggest. So I try and share it and Why share my screen. Give it a try. Give it that a would try. be great. Let's see. I think it's this one. So I'm sharing can you see the that? screen. Can you see that, Alice? I can't no. see it now. Try this no. one. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. Let me can put you it on it? slideshow. <laughs> can you play it, it on well? slideshow? Okay, How's we that? need to go out. There we go. Tell me when move. you want to move things, Ellison. Okay, I'll just say move. How's that? Okay, yeah. move. <laughs> okay. All right. First, let me say that having read the book, I think it's a brilliant book. It is uh, very much like Chris's talk, a very concise talk, argument, and book. But it's backed up by an incredible amount of detailed evidence and empirical justification for his arguments. I think, frankly, it's probably the best book on Japanese security in the last decade. No offense to Chris's many other books during the last decade. He's amazingly prolific. Um, what he does is sum up, as his talk indicated, various arguments about Japan's increasing defense posture. That's done a little more systematically in the book than he could in the talk. Um, but he makes a very good case for Japan's amazing increasing defense capabilities. I don't think most people know that if Japan fulfills its budget goals in the next five years and its promises, uh, Japan will go from the fifth or seventh strongest military power in the world in terms of firepower or defense spending to third in the world after the US and China, I believe. So that is quite a surprise for a country that started out after World War II 70 years ago as having basically in its constitution saying no military at all. Um, and I think one of the greatest contributions of his book is summarizing the other interpretation of what is happening in Japan now, um, and then saying the weaknesses of those arguments and giving his own interpretation of what all this means. Move. <laughs> Move, Chris. There we go. Uh, I agree with his general argument, move. Uh, Japan's security posture and policies have changed enormously and are changing significantly. To put it another way, uh, a former student of mine is now very high up in the US embassy in Japan, in the foreign service. And uh, he came through um, the area a few uh, weeks ago and we had lunch. And we both agreed, this is not your grandfather's Japan. It has changed and is changing enormously. Uh, I personally am one who has argued for a long time that Japan has never been a pacifist country as the media characterizes it, I think very erroneously. And it does all of us a disservice by saying it is pacifist. There's nothing, been nothing pacifist about Japan in the post-war except its literal wording of Article 9, which of course was imposed by the US in its constitution. What has limited Japanese defense policy, I would argue, is a significant anti-militarist minority that has limited the options on defense for many years. Hugh shows how this is changing very much as well. Move. Uh, Japan's main strategy is now to strengthen the US-Japan bilateral alliance, and I think bilateralism plus is a good characterization of these changes. Move. The post-war Yoshida doctrine is not relevant anymore, as Chris argues in his book. I agree with that completely. The, it was held together by the Cold War balance of terror, which was routinized, and the threats were Eurocentric. But now in the multipolar world, there are no organization and the threats are regional. Yoshida doctrine relied primarily on the US for defense, giving the US bases and minimally building up defense in order to pacify the US. So it was to continue protecting Japan. The military rise of China and North Korea has changed all this. And so Japan cannot rely only on the US for defense in a multipolar world. Move, please. Twice. Yep, again. And again. 
Okay, again, Chris, sorry. Again, <laughs> I don't know why this is happening. Let me, okay. let me. Do you want the next slide up? Yes, please. Alice? Yeah, okay. There you go. All right. Uh, but I have five major questions. I will concentrate on the uh, general arguments in the book rather than the defense capability part, which anybody who is interested in that should read because Chris knew, can go down in the weeds better than anybody else I know in the details of Japan's defense policy. Uh, this is not my specialty, so let me concentrate on the major themes of the book. Um, he argues that about the Yoshida Doctrine, but one of the things I don't think he addresses is that part of the Yoshida Doctrine was dependence on the US economically while growing its own military power. Ken Pyle has a very interesting article in which he argues that Yoshida never intended Japan to always be a relatively non-military power, but rather that it would build up its economic power first and then build up its military power. And that of course is exactly what's been happening. But since the 1990s, Japan is more economically dependent on China and Asia than the US. So that slide I have in there, the uh, graphic is a picture and shows how much more Japan is dependent on trade, for example, with China than the US. So my question to Chris is, wasn't there a stage between the end of the Cold War in 1990 and the Yoshida Doctrine's irrelevance at, the, at that time, at that point, but which during, for example, from let's say uh, 1990 to 2015, what Hegenbotham and Samuels called Japan's dual hedge. That is, it sought more autonomy from the US economically by getting closer to China and Asia, for example, helping to found APEC, but also get autonomy from China militarily by getting closer to the US. And this might be the intervening stage before bilateralism twice. This leads to my second question, Chris, that Japan's dependence economically on China may now be one of its greatest limitations or checks on bilateralism plus. Japan's greatest check previously was of course, it's significant, but some people say declining uh, anti-militarism minority in Japan. But now I wonder whether the thing that checks Japan's um, military dependence on the US to some extent, and it's how far it's willing to go with the US is its economic dependence on China and its need therefore to keep some, some vestige of good Chinese relations. So it can't go too far in the alliance. Next. And this, the anti-militarism declining uh, in Japan is leads to my next question. Um, one of the things I've always been, uh, lately been very amazed at, and I thought of doing it myself, but haven't, is that nobody has done a systematic analysis of this anti-militarism based on public opinion polls, et cetera. Everybody talks about it, but very few people have actually studied this anti-militarism. And um, so that leads to a couple of questions. Is it really declining as many people think it is? If so, is this decline due to the perceived threats from China, North Korea, and now the Ukraine crisis? One of the major facilitating factors moving Japan to bilateralism plus. Even if it is declining, but it still has some continued relevance as a factor in why elites must constantly cover their defense role changes to the public. And Chris, you allude to this in the book when you talk about the internationalism and multilateralism rhetoric that always surrounds Japan's defense changes. You talk about its use of the term dual use to cover its militarization of space. Aren't these a cover to make the um, very significant military changes more palatable to this anti-militarist minority which still has some role. Next, please. Move. So my final question is about the alliance dilemma, which is of course, Japan's longstanding 
attempt, as all small countries in alliance with a major military power must do, to both on the one hand avoid abandonment by the major power protecting them, and on the other hand avoid getting entangled in the major powers other military adventures abroad that are not in their interests. And the greatest example of this for Japan was of course avoiding getting involved in the, the uh, Vietnam War. But also avoiding combat overseas in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and this is now continuing the, at least the concentration on, on its own defense rather than going abroad with the US and everything as, as Chris points out. This is now continuing a bilateral um, plus. Chris implies that Japan's fear of abandoning by the US is to some extent responsible for bilateralism plus because it hopes to entangle the US in protecting Japan. So the US cannot abandon Japan. But doesn't this also mean entangling itself in overseas military activities abroad? If the integration of the alliance is that close and the military capabilities are sword and shield and these are totally integrated, doesn't that mean any regional conflict, Japan has very few options not to get entangled. But doesn't it also mean that Japan is entangling the US so that it can't refuse to defend Japan? And this means it is now a dual entanglement in which neither can abandon the other. And final slide. Final slide, please. So that is my contribution, and there, which is what the final slide was supposed to say. And I look very much forward to question and answers and hearing Chris's response to some of my questions. Thank you. Well, Dr. Cross, thanks so much. That was also a very, very useful uh, set of comments and questions on, on Chris's book. And um, I'm gonna use a moderator's prerogative just to make a couple points, couple that you kind of kind of uh, uh, beat me to as the discussant to one is this whole issue of economics. And, you know, uh, in, a, in a way, I'm, I'm not saying you, you have this dual integration in Asia, which is China plus Japan uh, through CPTPP and RCEP, and potentially, who knows, down the road, uh, China's uh, attempt to dock onto CPTPP as well. So in a way, there's kind of an intra-Asian integration um, not as a substitute or a zero sum, but certainly yeah. potentially at a faster pace than trans-Pacific economic integration. And I wonder what calculations that will mean for Japan going forward, not least because of a fact, two, two other factors that didn't come up. One was demography of Japan, which might further uh, require uh, the, if you will, I, I don't want to use this word, but reliance, dependence, integration with China and rest of East Asia for of transactional costs and other reasons, not least because of the formal arrangements. Um, the two questions I'll just leave you with to add on to those that Krauss, uh, Dr. Krauss mentioned, Chris, uh, one thing that didn't come out up at all, but is huge in this town where I am, Washington, DC right now, is Taiwan. What does your argument mean for Japan and Taiwan if this, if this dual entanglement is really at play? then, you know, is it really theoretical anymore to talk about whether Japan will or won't, will or won't get in? I mean, you know, the choice may be very minimal or marginal if, if the dual entanglement that Dr. Krauss posits is at play. And the other issue that didn't come up at all in either of your case, which is kind of interesting, which I hear time to time from my, my travels to Japan and colleagues, and it's not a particularly a dominant narrative to be sure, but whether the U.S., Sure, getting more, more integrated into the US, but where does the US wanna go, right? There's sometimes this question of whether given our politics in the last few years and developments and our views towards the world, is the US a variable that people wanna you know, manage too? I mean, in a way, China offers a certain clarity of probably its intended goals, whereas what exactly is the U.S. role in the years ahead, right? I mean, it's a, it's a fair question. We're going through a particular phase in American national life. So 
So anyway, those are my two questions. Uh, maybe why don't I give you, Chris, since you've had uh, Dr. Casa's discussion points and a couple of my questions first, and then we'll run uh, turn to Q and A. Yeah, th thanks, Atu, and thanks, thanks, Ellis. Uh, as always, you're too generous uh, in terms of what you say about my work, but but you know, in, in the questions you ask are very penetrating and uh, very good ones. Um, so so. Uh, uh, the first question, I, I, I don't know, I wonder if we've got a slightly different understanding of what the dual hedge was and what the Yoshida doctrine was. We may, may need to talk about this, but in, in many ways, I, I think they're kind of the same. I think we're probably saying the same thing. So I think the Yoshida doctrine was always about dual hedge, right? Uh, so it was always about, um, yeah, as you, you know, as Ken Parle says, so um, get close to the Americans, but not too close, right? Militarily or economically. Uh, likewise, it was always, we have to re-engage with China. Um, you know, as Yoshida just famously said, you know, it doesn't matter whether China's red or white, I don't care, you know, it's, ne it's next door to us, it's a market, in long term, we have to engage, that's geographical reality. Uh, and that's why Yoshida was in some ways the arch realist, right? It was always do whatever's expedient for Japan's national interest. So I think Japan has always been, I, I think that maybe we'll probably have to take this up separately, you know, uh, outside, but um, I think the dual hedge is not so different from the, from the, from the Yoshida doctrine. So, but I think what the change is that's happened under the Abe doctrine is that Japan has probably decided let's stop hedging, right? So um, let's really throw a lot in with the United States, a bit like the entanglement. Let's entangle ourselves, let's entangle the United States. Um, so let's fully commit, let's make this a real alliance, not just alignment, a real alliance. Let's integrate, you know, command and control capabilities and so on. Uh, and we're not going to get out of this anymore. We're not going to play that kind of Yoshida sort of game of just, you know, pretending to commit, but then actually going off and doing something else. And likewise, I think with China, it's a really interesting one, and maybe answer some of your other question, but, um, and Satu's questions, but yes, I mean, I think, you know, Japan wants to engage with China economically. It's really important. Again, it's kind of, yeah. um, I think that's, that's reality. Um, Japan doesn't want to decouple the way that some people in the United States talk about. Uh, in fact, some, Japan in some ways wants to make itself more indispensable uh, to China with maybe key investments, key technologies and so on. But but I think there's there's also an interesting shift, which I think you wouldn't have seen under Yoshida, but you do see under Abe and, you know, Kishida and so on uh, with, you know, national economic security law and things like that. I think it's for the first time China is seen as an economic adversary potentially as well. So you engage, you know, kind of regional trade and so on, but actually around sort of economic security, key supply chains, key technologies, um, rare earths and so on. Uh, this is, you know, actually China's potentially an adversary. And again, I think that's a major change. Yoshida and, and, his, and his, his successors never would have gone that far. So I think, you know, in a sense, um, uh, there's, there's been a real change and, and the hedging has, has, has declined. And actually Japan is, trying, is making some pretty firm choices now about where it stands. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think that's, that's kind of why I think... Can, can I pop in here for yeah. just two little yeah, comments on that very quickly? Uh, first is, are you saying that Japan wants to be an ally more like Britain and less like Germany of the US? Because Germany did hedge its bets with Iraq, for example, and that it's really moved somewhat from the German posture to the British posture of uh, the 2000s, 2010s. And the other- um, uh, Interesting question. Yeah. Hmm. And the, and the other thing, of course, is that um, does Japan have a choice about because of its economic dependence? And does technology and the integration of military technology and security and economic uh, security, does that integration make it even more difficult to uh, Japan to disentangle itself yeah. from both China and the U, but particularly the US? To give, well, um, does it want to be like Britain? Um, yeah, to some extent. I mean, if that's that's probably a better model in some ways. And, and, and I, do, I do think over the last, you know, we've seen this with the whole debate around collective self-defense and so on, right? Is this, there is a, I don't think it's just pure rhetoric. I think there's been a kind of mind shift, a, a mindset shift amongst Japanese, the, the, the elite policymakers that, uh, you know, this whole thing about, you know, no country can defend itself by, you know, alone. Uh, you know, security threats are, are global. They, you know, they, they stretch across boundaries. Technology stretches across boundaries. Um, we cannot go alone anymore. We cannot be, you know, an isolated sort of one country pacifism, this kind of thing. Uh, and we, you know, our, our, our security destiny is bound up with the United States. And, and I think that's, that's, that's a major shift. So, and, and I think there's, there's, there are parallels with the kind of, you know, the, um, 
uh, UK US alliance in that sense in that, uh, that those bonds have always been strong and I think um, you know the UK of course is you know very attached to, to NATO and so on but there's but nevertheless I think there is a kind of sense of you know we are two you know two states that really have you know very converging strong interests and actually uh, we should be more comfortable in terms of converging interests and capabilities. I, th I, I think there's an element of that Japan. I don't want to imply that Japan is just blindly going to devote itself to whatever the United States wants to do, but I think there's much more acceptance in the past and the whole kind of hedging and trying to delay those sorts of choices is, is less and less something that Japanese policymakers uh, want to think about. Can, can you know, can, can Japan, I suppose your second question is really, and your follow-up question there, Alice, is, is when it comes to the crunch, you know, um, and we're in a conflict with, with China, your, your question is, you know, would, would um, Japan's economic interests somewhat trump its security interests, right? Or would they become, Japan would have to choice and therefore would it be restrained from what it could do with the United States and, and so it would on? Limit it, right. Yeah, limit it, maybe. But, but again, I, I think Japan's estimation, estimation of the threat from China has changed, as I said. So in a sense, I think China, you know, the, the, any time before, it's now crossing red lines for, for Japanese core national security interests, right? Whether it's Japanese territory, whether it's Taiwan, whether it's sea lanes, whether it's actually undermining potentially the entire US security system in the region. You know, this is pretty existential now uh, for, for Japan. So of course, you know, Japan wants to deter China, wants to obviate any of those kinds of conflicts, uh, will engage China where necessary, but engage it from strength, think about ways to engage it economically. But I think there, there is a realization in certain areas, probably Japan is gonna to have to throw in its lot uh, in terms of security with a military uh, security with the United States, otherwise, uh, Japan is going to face China alone, right? Which is which is you know, totally unpalatable. And again, going back to the economic side, that's a really powerful um, constraint on, on on Japan. But also, as I said, I think there's a bit of shift in sense of that. Um, you know, whilst Japan wants to cooperate with China, of course, it's really really important. At the same time, China is now seen as a threat to Japan economically in a way that it never was seen before. Uh, so uh, I think there's a sort of so perhaps you know the, this, the military side will outweigh the economic side. Uh, it's really posing very very difficult choices for Japanese policymakers, but they may decide that they have to jump essentially in terms of their core national security interests. You know, if China starts taking territory off 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 Japan. I think it's going to be very hard to say. Well, we, you know, we won't we won't uh, we won't get ourselves in, into a conflict. Um, public opinion. I mean, yeah, I, I think we essentially agree. Um, of course, you know, public opinion. How do you gauge that in Japan? Um, I didn't do a lot of this in the book because I didn't have space. Uh, I, I've done this in earlier books. I think we, I mean, I would say, yes, it's declining as a constraint because it depends who you ask in Japan, how you ask the question. If you ask them, you know, a Japanese public, would you like to do more in defense? They're probably increasingly many are saying yes, but then you ask them how, how are you going to pay for it? Then they become a little bit more doubtful, right? Like they would in most advanced democracies. Um, but nevertheless, I think we're beginning to see public opinion swinging behind a more robust uh Japanese national military stance a much more robust uh alliance um uh stance and then ultimately you know the ultimate public opinion poll in Japan's elections right and Japanese public keep electing governments that you know quite openly say we are going to do much more uh in military policy so in a sense I think that's the that's the trajectory um so I think it's declining as 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 as, as, a, as, as a barrier but does it need to be managed? Of course, yeah. I mean, Japanese policymakers are um, brilliant, right? The LDP are, are fantastic at doing controversial things, but being able to tough it out when the public doesn't um, like it. But also, you know, their, their main choice is to try and obfuscate what Japan is doing, right? So they obfuscate what Japan is doing to mollify public opinion, to mollify coalition partner like Komeito, to mollify opinion in, in East Asia. Um, and they will continue to do all, use all kinds of you know linguistic artifices and uh, you know careful means in order to manage this debate because they really don't need uh, need um, uh, the, the the controversy. I think we've probably covered the entanglement sort of issue. I think yes, I think Japan is probably trying to entangle itself. It's better to be entrapped than abandoned. I think is is the Japanese calculation. Uh, and it's you know it's trying to entangle with the United States, uh, so that it, Japan you know U.S. can't can't leave can't depart. Um, I think this goes to to Satu's question, right? Um, what about the United States as a variable? Of course, you know Japan has been watching the United States very very carefully um, uh, 
uh, and um, it's it's sort of I think its ultimate nightmare is that you know the US um, backs away from its commitments in the region. So the Japanese reaction to that increasingly, you know, over time has been to uh, reinvest and show that it will do more to um, to support the United States, that it is a better ally, that it will integrate with the United States. So that it becomes you know it becomes perhaps more likely the United States is going to intervene and, and support Japan in, in conflicts and it will show that it's a more alliance, reliable alliance partner. So therefore, you know, you know, um, the US will support it. And that's very clear, you know, message from Biden administration, right? It's like, you know, what he said about Afghanistan. He says, if you don't fight for yourself, we're not going to defend you, right? So it's the same. I think that message went, you know, went down in Japan is, you know, if you don't, if we don't, we're not prepared to defend ourselves, the US is not going to come to our assistance either. Mm. So uh, I think, um, you know, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's trying to entangle the United States. And then, and then I think Sato's question about Taiwan is a really, really interesting one. I, I do cover this in the book. I didn't say much in the, in the talk, but uh, I think, um, I think Japanese policy makers have always kind of known that if there's a, there's a conflict that Japan is going to be entangled in, trapped in some way. But of course, they've played very clever games in the past trying to, to, um, you know, Play their own game of strategic ambiguity vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis the United States to make sure that nobody's too adventurous in this conflict. But increasingly, I think it's hard for the Japanese to, to hedge uh, and increasingly hard for them to sort of postpone those decisions. You know, they are kind of on the front line now uh, with the kinds of activities that China's shown around, around Taiwan. Um, and, you know, the expectations from the United States are, are rising for Japan to do more. And I think there's, again, there's an increasing acceptance in Japan that, you know, uh, Taiwan uh, is, you know, um, uh, the thin end of the wedge, if, if, if you like, for in terms of Japan's own security. And of course, as, as Keisha just said, you know, um, uh, you know, Ukraine today is, you know, is sort of Asia tomorrow. In other words, it's Taiwan tomorrow. So, if, um, you know, this, you know, China is serious about taking back um, Taiwan, is serious about taking our territory. You know, we have to do. We, you know, we have to. We have to just kind of front up, and we have to support the United States here. So, um, and then on the ground, if you look at the dispositions, and I cover this in the book, you know, very much, you know, JSDF capabilities, uh, and the defense of the south southwestern islands. They're very much designed to support the U.S. Marines uh, to be the kind of the, the force that blunts the first Chinese, uh, you know, offensive in that area, mm. and then they're there to help, you know, support the U.S. surge. Back into the region to counter uh, China's offensive. So, yeah, I mean, I think you know J Japan is becoming increasingly just joined up and integrated with with U.S. overall strategy and, and operational strategy on the ground. Mm. Well, but thank I think you. Japan can keep out of Taiwan. Can cannot keep out of Taiwan. Yeah. Thank you. Well, listen, I, I do want to get to some of the Q and A questions and comments here. So let me start with uh, Benjamin Self over at the Mansfield Foundation. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ben. Um, praises your talk. First, a big picture question. As you noted, China has brought the focus back to Northeast Asia and reliance on US to balance PLA power. Given United Nations PKOs and HADR operations in the Middle East and Africa have declined or is ceased, is the current security role even Indo-Pacific wide, let alone global? Is his first question. Uh, and you can see it in the Q&A yourself as well. The second question he asks is, Japan moves to establish jointness across the SDF and develops cross-domain capabilities. Do you foresee building more deeply integrated alliance command and control? What are the obstacles? So two, two big questions there, maybe take a Couple of minutes each, and then we'll turn to a couple others that are in yeah. the in the queue. Um, yeah. I, 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 so, so um, um, what I argue, in the, I mean, the book's title is Japan as a global military power, right? But of course, the subtitle is New Capabilities, Alliance Integration, Bilateralism Plus. And those subtitles they don't feature on the cover, but they're they're crucial. So, really, what I'm arguing, I think, is the same that that Ben is 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 asking me is is um, you know. Japan will do, th uh, what I'm arguing is Japan will do some things globally. I think it will do some things in the Indo-Pacific. Um, it's shown that it will do that. But again, what, what drives it to do that is not uh, some kind of internationalist impulse, some, some desire to you know, be more um, um, you know, sort of forthcoming to support other states necessarily in, in their security struggles. But you know, understandably, a lot of what it does is in order to show 
commitment to the US-Japan alliance system, which then will um, shore up the alliance system, the alliance back in Japan's own neighborhood in order to deal with its homeland defense. So, you know, I think the Indo-Pacific is, you know, free and open Indo-Pacific, Japan will do more with, with various, various partners. But again, a lot of it's what it's about, and this is very interesting when Japan interacts with European um, partners, is trying to kind of flood the region, right, with extra regional actors in order to complicate China's freedom of action, which again is going to support uh, Japan's own, own homeland defense. Um, will we see more, are we seeing more jointness? I think that's where Japan is, is trying to go with the United States. Uh, command and control will be crucial. We've, we've seen some of that already uh, through ballistic missile defense and co-location of command and control, information sharing and so on. But I think Ben's right. I think Japan's gonna have to do, and I think Japanese policymakers are aware they're gonna have to do more and of course, this is one of the kind of key things I think probably is on the sort of wish list of alliance managers from the US side, at least, is to have more sort of joint operational, sort of joint operational command structures. Uh, because at the moment, they're very, you know, they're very sort of uh, clunk, clunky, don't work very well. So I think, you know, probably there's going to be more work on those joint command structures, uh, more work on joint contingency planning. Uh, these are the kinds of things which, um, you know, Japan and US like to do. What are the barriers? I mean, of course, there'll be some political resistance in, in, in Japan, but I think some of it's just about Japan learning to do these things, right? And, and building those military to military connections and also connections within the JSDF itself. I mean, they're not that joint. So Japan is on a journey, but I think in, in, when we see these revisions of these various documents at the end of the year, I think we'll probably see some quite heavy emphasis on thinking about joint, joint operations and possibly more uh, integration with the United States. Else, do you have anything on this comment? Otherwise, we can move to the next question if you have something. Okay. All right. Let me then move to the next question. There's a question about, I'll take a couple because of time uh, limits. Um, what about the position for India to play uh, a role in this US-Japan increasing uh, binded relationship? Um, you know, I'll leave the question about how India can strengthen the quad because it's a little bit tangential, but but sort of India in this US-Japan relationship as it deepens and integrates. Um, another uh, speaker here, uh, another participant here, uh, you know, focuses on China's response to China will become the center of Japanese security and foreign policy, um, which kind of ties in with what you said about the US-Japan alliance. That it, Japan's response to China is in part the US-Japan alliance response to China. Uh, but how will international cooperation such as PKOs be positioned in this context? You, you dealt with a little bit of that in, in, in the question to Ben. So why don't I take, give you those, India and sort of China centrality, which you kind of already accept as part of your, you, the basis yeah. of the book. Uh, yeah, India, I mean, there's a little bit about that in the book. I mean, I think, I think Japan has, has always had high hopes for, for, for India. Uh, of course, that, that, that was always a major thrust of, of Abe's strategy, right? As, uh, you know, the fellow democracy, um, perhaps um, beginning to, you know, has, has drifted clearly in, uh, not always in the best of terms with, with, with China. Um, so um, I think, you know, I think Japan will work quite patiently with, with India bilaterally and, th and through the Quad to try and bring India on its side. But again, I think the Japanese, Japanese policy is also realistic that you know, India is um, has limitations in terms of how far it wants to go in terms of uh, uh, cooperation. So it will always be, you know, I think it will always be a really, really important counterweight in terms of to China in terms of Japanese strategic um, calculations. The question, the question of China, I, um, I wasn't quite, sh I don't, I'm not sure I fully understood the, the exact question, but I guess um, UNPKO, where does that fit? Was that the question, Satu, in terms of? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think what I argue in the book is that UNPKO is um, essentially is, it's like zero now, right? I mean, Japan is doing is doing very very little, despite you know all the all the hopes that were built up for Japan to really find this as a uh, a kind of key uh, contribution to international security. Of course, Japan does a lot around training and, and funding of UNPKO, but in terms of actually, if you like, sort of boots on the ground military operations, Japan is doing very very little. So uh, I think it's um, I think it's another sign that essentially that. Japan is retrenching, right, from from taking risks outside its own region, and it's pulling back its most of its capability to really focus on its its kind of homeland uh, security. But of course, Japan still talks about the you know, whole idea of international peace cooperation, which sort of alludes back to uh, 
UNPKO, and I think it's a very useful device to legitimize within Japanese society the idea that these various operations are, because it has international as a label, therefore it's legitimate. Ellis, anything? No, although I, I do wonder one thing occurred to me while Chris was talking about PKO, I agree with that, but you know, Japan's push to become a member of the more permanent member of the Security Council uh, may induce them to do a little bit more, at least symbolically, uh, on PKO to justify that. Um, my final comment is just that uh, I disagree with Chris on his saying that I'm much too complimentary to him, as Mark reported <laughs> to say, it has the advantage of being true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, listen, Chris, we, we, we're, we're a couple minutes over, but I do want to take this on a last question. Considering that the PRCCCP is generally quick to push the narrative that the region is threatened by Japan's movement towards strengthening its defense forces, if there is a significant shift in their defense posture, uh, uh, Japan's defense posture and policy, what might be the Japanese response to reassuring allies in the region to counter that narrative? I myself don't pick that up at all when my travels through Southeast Asia and India. If anything, there seems to be a fairly high demand signal for Japan's, if you will, for lack of a better word here, normalization, activism, uh, proactivity, whatever you know, whatever you want to phrase it as. I mean, I find a pretty high demand signal for it. They want Japan to be more uh, integrated, more agile, yeah. more independent. So what do you make of this question? I, I tend to agree with that view. I mean, I think, um, um, you know, uh, uh, Paul Midford, one of my you know good colleagues, has written about you know how Japan is uh, as it has we slightly disagree disagree on sort of you know where Japan is going, but nevertheless, as Japan has moved along this trajectory, uh, you know it's been again it goes back to somewhat to Ellis's question around public opinion, sort of managing the whole discourse around security so as not to to you know uh, cause cause alarm. Uh, Japan has been tremendously careful, I think, in the way that it's 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 reassured. Uh, regional neighbours, you know, it's moved very, very carefully. And of course, it's done all of this, you know, through working with the United States, which, you know, by and large is, is you know, it, for most uh, states in the region is seen as, um, you know, uh, the kind of the upholder of the of the, of the security, you know, the, the sort of regional security system. So Japan has moved really, really carefully. So I think you're right. I think that I think by and large, uh, a certain kind of Japanese uh, military role Mm. It, that is, you know, that is seen to be responsible. That's challenged through, channeled through, uh, kind of trusted agency, uh, and it was also wrapped around, you know, with this language of internationalism and, and contribution. I think it's it's pretty welcome uh, in the region. But of course, you know, Japan is very aware that it has to be very careful about, you know, how far uh, it, it pushes this role because there are still some sort of lingering suspicions of um, of you know past Japanese role in the region, but also just generally, you know, interference in, in certain parts of the region by the great powers. So uh, so I think Japan has been pretty skillful in the way that it's managed. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's growing role in the region. Well, thank you. We'll let you oh, have- Can I just add one point? Yeah, I just sure. Say yes. that the one thing Japan also has to be careful of is not only managing public opinion, but the security dilemma with China in Asia um, is, of course, it's very important that they manage uh, uh, China's feelings. Otherwise, and they may already be in a, in a major security dilemma where Japan's defensive moves are interpreted by China as offensive. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Well, listen, we will have to uh, close this particular uh, webinar up now because of the time. But Chris, we're always waiting for your next book. As Ellis mentioned, you're so prolific. You've got this series now. This is number four. We're waiting for number five, I think, if I'm counting correctly, your next book on Japan. And we'll take a look at uh, your current assessment and, and see where it is in a couple of years. So we always welcome you back. Thank you so much for joining us uh, early evening or sort of almost late evening now, your time in, in, in England. And Ellis, thanks so much for joining us as always. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to to make some comments today and all our participants welcome and please stay tuned or sign up for further information on upcoming east west center publications programs and initiatives with that i bid you all good day good morning good evening wherever you are be well be safe and look forward to seeing you again bye-bye now thank you thanks Alice. thank you Satu. cheers chris <laughs>